Have you ever been inside a data center? It's amazing. Rows and rows of switches, routers, servers, just buzzing and humming, powering the internet we use every day. Whew, getting goosebumps just thinking about it. And as you're learning networking, you've got to wonder, how does all that work? What does a data center network look like? Is it different from any other network? That's what we're talking about today. How do network engineers go about designing data center networks? And also a huge shout out to Boson Software for sponsoring this video. They are the official sponsor of this course. They help make it free here on YouTube and they just happen to have the best prep software out there for the CCNA. If you need labs, exams, courseware, they got you. Check it out, link below. Now data centers are different, right? Like if you look at a corporate office, you got people trying to connect to things and the internet. A data center is all about servers connecting to things and the internet. But for a long time, we've kind of designed their networks the same way, with the same model. But first I wanna start with this. What exactly is a data center and what's the purpose of it? And also, when will you get to work on a data center and what situation would you have to step into one and do stuff in one? Which you probably will. If you're going down the networking path, you probably, it's, it's gonna be awesome. Like, yeah, I'm so excited for you. I remember my first time at a data center and it was nothing short of magical. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like I was at Disneyland. Now I'll start with this. Pretty much any resource you access over the internet or just in, in a network period is gonna be inside a data center. And you've seen data centers before, either on TV or what I just showed you earlier. I mean, here's one. I'm actually doing a 360 tour of Google's data center. Just rows and rows, racks and racks, full of servers, routers, switches. Like I said, Disneyland. So like right now, you may be watching me on YouTube and this is a Google data center. So you might be watching me from this server right here. It's streaming to you from here. Okay, big companies like Google have data centers. Facebook has data centers, massive data centers. Amazon, Microsoft. And if you join their network team, you might get access and be able to work inside those. But what about other companies that aren't as big as Google, Facebook, or Amazon? Do all companies have and use data centers? The answer is yes, but not all in the same way. So let's say we have Network Chuck Coffee. Get yours today. Network Chuck Coffee sells coffee online through a website, a website that lives on a server. So for me to offer that service to you, I got a few options. I could open up my own data center, which doesn't always mean having a massive warehouse with rows and rows of servers. It might just be one room with one rack, which is what I have in my house. I've got my one rack of equipment, some routers in there, switches, servers, and you can access my stuff directly from my internet connection. A lot of small to medium sized companies do have a situation like this. One of my first ever jobs doing network engineering they, on their first floor of their building, had a little small networking closet that was like a data center. It had three racks full of servers, routers, and switches. And that was our web presence. That's where we ran our websites. That was everything. Now, maybe my home internet connection isn't great, or I don't have adequate air conditioning and a raised floor, and I don't have everything to meet the standards I need to actually run a company. Well, then I might want to put my stuff in a real data center. And they do offer all those things. Redundant cooling, redundant power, all things you need if you're going to run a company. So I would rent space in a data center instead or rent racks. This is what the majority of the companies I work for have done. Now this will look like one of the larger data centers. It'll have rows and rows of racks of servers and stuff, but they're from different customers that the data center has. You might have Joe's Zebra Farm over here, Bob's Biscuits right here, and the Network Chuck Coffee over here. You can rent you know, two, three, four, maybe a couple rows of racks. And so you put your servers in there, your routers, your switches, and the data center would provide you with power and internet connection. Now what I actually do for Network Chuck Coffee is I use the cloud. The cloud still involves a data center, but it's someone else's data center and someone else's servers. So Amazon, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, they offer their servers and their data center to you as a service. You don't need to rent space or have your own hardware or anything. You just say, click, click, I want my website to be right there, and it happens. So now when we talk about data center and network design, if your company's fully cloud, which is rare, um, if they're all in the cloud, you don't really have to concern yourself with how they design the network because they handle it for you. Unless you're a network engineer for one of these cloud providers, then you know all about this. And we'll cover how they do it because it, it's not very different from how you would want to design your, your data center up here. So if your company has its own data center in its building or they rent rack space in another data center, this is where you come in and you have to know how to design a data center network. And again, a lot of companies have this situation. They actually might have a combination of all three of these here. The first company I work for did have this, but they eventually did rent space in another data center. We retained both of those and we added stuff to the cloud. That's called hybrid cloud. And that's a whole other video. So let's talk about how you should design your data center network. So this is what I would do if I were designing my network Chuck Coffee data center Traditionally, the old way, let's say I rented a bunch of rack space in a data center. I have all my racks here. Each of these racks would have a bunch of servers doing all kinds of stuff, websites, databases, and for the network. In each rack, I would have one or two switches right at the top. We actually call these our Tor switches. 
Nothing to do with the dark web. It stands for top of rack switches, T-O-R. Because yeah, it's at the top of the rack. And the servers in each rack will connect to their switch. Now, how do all these servers talk to each other and get to the internet? Well, I'd have my next layer, my distribution layer. If you watched my last video, this might start looking a little bit familiar to you. Our top of rack switches, which we could also refer to as our access layer switches, would connect to our distribution layer switches, redundant connections as we should have. And then we'd have another layer of switching, our core switch, our big daddy beast, which I know looks like a building, but this is a switch. It's a switch, a multi-layer switch. And that's what our distribution layer switches would connect to. Access layer, distribution layer, or aggregation layer, and our core, or our core layer. Now, just so you know, the distribution and core layer in a real data center would not be out floating in the air like this. They would often either be in their own dedicated network rack or maybe resting in some extra space in one of these racks here. Now, this is bothering me. With the proper three-tier design, you want to have some redundancy. So let me add another core switch here, which, again, is a beefy, massive chassis switch that costs a ton of money. But you got to have it if you're going with this design. That way we have some redundancy, some resiliency. And then if we had more racks in that data center, or for like Facebook and Amazon, and we own the entire data center and all that stuff is ours, they would also have an access layer with the top of a rack switch with distribution switches, and those would connect back to the same core as the other racks did. Now here we have a huge problem, which you might be going, well, Chuck, it seems okay, right? Like we have redundancy. If one switch goes down, things are still up. And you know what? You're right about that. But we started to notice a problem. You see, things started to change. You see, it used to be that we only cared about the traffic that went to and from the internet. And we designed our networks that way. What does that mean? Like well, if, if me here, wanting to buy some coffee, because I ran out, I'll access Network Check Coffee through the internet. It'll take me to my data center, to my core layer, my core switches, which will then get me down to my access layer, or sorry, distribution layer switches, down to my access layer switch, and then down to the server I need to be at. And of course, vice versa, the server will give the information I need through that same uh, path. This is what we call north-south traffic, or northbound and southbound traffic. That's what we cared about, and that's what we prioritized with our designs. But things started to change. You see, when this design was popular, we didn't worry too much about these servers right here talking to, let's say, servers and storage and resources over here between the racks. This type of traffic was not important until virtualization came in. With virtualization, our data centers became more distributed, which basically means that servers in this rack now have a pretty stinking good reason to talk to servers over here in this rack and maybe in this rack and this rack. Basically, servers within the data center in various racks want to or need to communicate with each other. That's what we call east-west traffic. Oh, and I didn't label this before, so this was north-south, and this is east-west, kind of horizontal communication. Now, the problem is, is that we didn't design our network for east-west traffic. We designed it for north-south traffic, but with the big changes we have with technology, east-west traffic accounted for the majority of our traffic. In fact, it's 80% of our traffic in our data center, and it has the biggest bang, the biggest impact on the way our network performs. So with our three-tier design, if one server, let's say this server down here, wants to communicate with this server, or it needs to because of our new virtualization technologies, with three tiers, it's going to go from our top of rack switch to our distribution layer. And then it hops over to our core layer, and then down to the distribution layer here, and then to the top of rack switch, and finally to that server. Now that might not seem too bad, but that's way too many hops for communication that needs to happen crazy fast. And with today's technologies, things have to be quick. They have to be crazy fast. And this wasn't cutting it. We had to go back to the drawing board. How do we fix this? Not only that, that, that wasn't the only issue. We also had things like, hey, uh, we got these redundant links between our top of rack switches and our aggregate layer switches. But with spanning tree, which you'll learn about later, but this is basically what it does, it will shut down one of these links and keep the other one active. It will do that on each one of these redundant links, avoiding what's called a switching loop, which will basically blow up your network. So three-tier design, the campus design, not for data centers. We need something faster, something quicker, something a little crazy. So let's take this business out of here. We don't want this. I'm also going to take out the internet for a second. And we're also going to take out our core layer. We don't need that anymore. Goodbye, core layer. Actually, let's just start over. It's kind of messy. <laughs> okay, new design. Here we go. We're still going to have our top of rack switches, but we're going to give them a new name. <laughs> we're going to call them leaf switches, which might sound weird. I know, but legit. L-E-A-F, leaf. And they're still going to serve the function of being the access layer for the servers in those racks. Now, here's where the real difference is. We have a new type of switch. It might seem like he's doing the same job as the distribution layer. And in a large way, he is. But we don't call them distribution switches now. We call them spine switches. And when you hear the term spine, I want you to automatically think about backbone. Keep it all back related. In networking, our backbone, much like our body, supports the entire network. It has to be able to handle the most bandwidth the most packets going through it. It's gotta be a beefy switch or a beefy router. 
But in this case, it's a bit different because each one of these switches aren't going to be backbone caliber. Like in the model before with our three-tier model, the core layer is a beefy, multi-chassis beast. Like, don't mess with that guy. <laughs> He'll kill you. But with this model, these guys are, they're, they're powerful, moderately so. And here's how they connect. Our top of rack switches, or our, our leaf switches, will have something kind of weird, which might, it, it'll feel weird. We're going to have a full mesh, and things are about to get messy. Meshy. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. I'm going to use red. This top of rack switch will connect here. And here. And here. And this top of rack switch, this leaf switch, will connect here. And here. And here. What am I doing here? Notice each leaf switch is connected to every spine switch. We're basically creating a full mesh between the leaf switches and the spine switches. Like I said, meshy. This is what we want. This is what we call our spine leaf design. It's often referred to as a cloth design as well. This is the standard right now. This is how people, companies, businesses, Facebook, Google, design their data centers. They might modify a few things here and there, but this is the base design they use. But why? Why, why is this better? This looks messy. Why, why would we do this? This is not clean at all. Cabling nightmare. And you're right. That's one of the downsides is um, when you do a design like this, you better have a lot of cables. You better have some fiber, some ethernet, whatever. But you know, fiber, fiber. You're in a data center. Use some fiber. Told you things will get meshy. Last time I'm going to use that. I'm sorry. Now let me show you why this is a powerful design. Remember, we care about east-west traffic. We want this server to be able to talk to this server as fast as possible. And with this design, here's how it happens. He says, yep, I'm ready to talk. How does he get there? Well, using any of the spine switches, he can go bam, one hop, bam, two hops, two hops. And that's always the case all the time, every time. No matter where you are in this design, if I'm this server right here and I want to go to this server over here, I'm one two hops away, just like that. Whereas before in the three tier design, it could be three hops or more. It's unpredictable. And that's the key with the spine leaf design. It's predictable and it's reliable. Because again, we care more about the east west traffic, server to server traffic, than we do the north and southbound traffic to the internet, to the user. Because east west is 70 to 80% of our traffic in the data center. Now a quick recap of things I want you to remember. These right here, leaf switches. These right here, spine switches. Spine, it's our backbone. Slightly beefy, can handle a lot. They are our workhorses. Now, they themselves don't have to be these massive multi-chassis switches because they share the load amongst themselves. And that's the other thing I want you to know. The traffic is low balance across these equally, which is possible because, you know, we have a full mesh here. Every leaf switch is connected to every spine switch. Also notice these spine switches themselves don't connect to each other. And yes, with this design, we go a bit cable crazy, but man, a maximum of two hops for any server-to-server -server communication. Now, let me show you what these switches look like so you have a visual. Here we have what's called our Cisco Nexus class switches. If you're just getting into the Cisco world, the main switches we use for like access distribution, core, and like the campus environment are our catalyst switches. The Nexus switches are for data center. They are specifically designed for data center. They're crazy. The throughput is mind blowing. Like look at this. This two RU unit, which means two rack units. It's the thick boy. 12.84 um, terabits per second of bandwidth or throughput. That's a pretty beefy spine switch. And then right here we have a smaller one, which is our 9332C. It's one RU, or one U, but it's still amazing. 6.4 terabits per second of bandwidth. Here's a list of their Nexus switches. Now they do have these massive chassis. Look at this guy. This guy will make you cry, he's so massive and, and crazy. But I wanna show you this real quick. If we get back down to our 9300 series here, notice it says it can be a leaf or a spine. And that's up to how big your network is. If you got 30 to 50,000 servers you're trying to accommodate, you're gonna need some big stuff. Now, one more crazy thing I wanna show you about the spine leaf design, and that's how these leaf switches are connected to the spine switches. This connection right here, most often, is not layer two. It's layer three. You may recall from the other videos in this course, layer three is routers dealing with IP addresses. Layer two, switches dealing with MAC addresses. Typically, when you connect two switches together, that's gonna be layer two. And that's a lot of what you would see with a three-tier design. And we'll cover more on layer two and how we do all of that later on in this course, but I wanted to point out that these connections, switch to switch, are not layer two. They're actually layer three, which means, yes, this leaf switch and this Spine switch, they're both layer three switches or multi-layer switches. And this does two things for us. First is we don't have to worry about any one of these links being blocked by spanning tree. Spanning tree is a loop prevention mechanism at layer two. We'll cover more on that later. But in a spanning tree world, two of these links would be blocked by default, only one link being allowed to prevent a loop. But because we're using layer three and we're routing, we could low balance across these links, keep them all up 
and use the full bandwidth we have. And that was number two. Yeah, we can, we can low balance between these. Now, data center design does not stop here. It gets a lot crazier. This is just what we call the underlay, kind of the foundation network. On top of that, we'll have what's called the overlay network. And this is how all the big players design their networks. Facebook, Amazon, Google, whoever they are. The spine leaf architecture design just gets our stuff connected. The overlay does some insane network automation, Cisco ACI stuff. Now, I'm throwing buzzwords out at you, and I'm not going to go into it right now because we will cover it later on. But just know we're scratching the surface. That's it. Hey, were you paying attention? Because <laughs> right now we're going to quiz you. We're going to see what you know. We're going to pull some questions out of the Boson XM Max for CCNA, which is the best practice exam for CCNA. I highly encourage you to check that out in the link below. Anyways, let's see what you got. Which of the following devices cannot be connected to leaf nodes in the Cisco ACI architecture? Now, this might throw you off a little bit, but let's see what you got. Ready, set, go. Now, before I show the answer, I do want to say this. Seeing Cisco ACI might have thrown you off a little bit, but you may remember that I mentioned ACI as one of the network programmability or network automation platforms that depends on the spine leaf design as its underlay or network underlay. So if you saw leaf node, you could have made the jump to, hey, maybe they're talking about spine leaf. And if they say leaf node, maybe that also means leaf switch, which it does. So given what we learned, which device cannot be connected to a leaf node? Now, right off the bat, we can say uh, spine nodes. That can't be true because spine nodes do connect to leaf nodes. That's how the architecture works. Now, you haven't learned about EPGs or APICs, and we haven't talked specifically about application servers. That leaves us with leaf nodes. Can a leaf node connect to a leaf node? Well, in that architecture, no, they can't. Let's see if we're right. Select it, show answer, and we are indeed correct. If you got that right, fantastic job. You're one step closer to getting your CCNA. And then here's Boson's excellent explanation. Again, check that out, link below. Question number two. Which of the following statements are true regarding physical connections in the Cisco ACI architecture? Now, again, given the last question, Cisco ACI architecture, we're gonna think, hey, Spine leaf. Let's think about that. Let's think about that. Anyways, get set, go. All right, welcome back. Let's see how you did. So we have to select two choices here. What's true? Now, things we can take off immediately. First, spine nodes must be fully meshed, which might have been a bit confusing, but what they mean is are the spines connecting to each other in a full mesh? Well, we know that spines don't connect to spines, so that's definitely not true of the Cisco ACI architecture or the spine leaf design. What about B? Each spine must connect to every leaf node. Hey, we do know that to be true. Let's select that sucker. Yup. Now see, we haven't talked about, so that might be like, I don't, I'm not sure. D, leaf nodes must be fully meshed. No, they don't because leaves don't connect to leaves. Let's take that sucker right out. And then E, each leaf node must connect to every spine node. Hey, we know that to be true. I think that's right. So, you know, we got two answers that we know to be true. Let's, uh, let's check it out. Did we get it right? Yeah, we got it right. There's Boson's excellent explanation. If you got that right, Man, you're killing it. Again, one step closer to CCNA. And these questions are often considered harder than the actual exam. That's how Boson is. They try to model the exam as close as they can. And often, and many people will agree, it's more difficult. So if you can pass Boson, I think you're ready. Well, that was CCNA episode seven. We talked about the spy and leaf architecture. It's how we design our data center networks. And you know what, honestly? It's how we're starting to design our campus networks as well, but I'll get into that later. <laughs> it's a crazy world now with networking. Everything's changing. You're coming in at a good time. Trust me. Anyways, let me know what you thought about the video below. If you like it, like it. Um, if you haven't already, subscribe. We just hit 500,000 subscribers, which is, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say. So thank you. You guys are amazing. And if you want to help me do more of what I do here, making courses, making content that's educating you, helping you get that next job, helping you uh, advance in IT, consider joining my membership. Either join the YouTube membership with the join button below or go to thisisit.io. That's a membership, a mission that me and David Bomb will run. We both have committed to producing free content. We're both doing a CCNA right now, which is crazy. We're also working with Jeremy Chara on a Security Plus course, completely free here on YouTube. And joining This Is IT helps us do more of this. You also get access to all of our stuff on This Is IT before we release it here on YouTube. So check it out. Anyways, that's all I got. I would love to hear what you guys think of this video below. Uh, I love seeing your comments. I try to respond as many as I can. Uh, I just love seeing you guys. And if you need community, if you need help, if you just need support, an encouraging word, consider joining my Discord server below. A ton of people in the industry who are willing to help you out and encourage you. Anyways, that's all I got today, guys. 
I'll catch you guys later.